Hey, I'm so glad that you clicked on my thumbnail, and I'm glad to see your beautiful face smiling back at me. My name's Thomas Brush, I'm the creator of a game called Pinstripe. I'm also working on a game called Once Upon a Coma. I've been making games for 10 years, it's my full-time job, I love what I do, but I never really had a system in place to actually create menu systems with animations, effects, make it look really cool, and most importantly, keep it simple. All right, so the very first thing that you're gonna need to do is create a 4K image in Photoshop, Illustrator. Um, so just go to image size here and make sure that when you create your image, it's 3,840 3, pixels wide by 2,160 pixels wide. And this is going to be a 4K image. It should work on all 4K devices. So you'll see I've got a logo here. I've got some cool little flourishes here. Um, I have text, but these are just reference um, layers. We're not going to actually use these in Unity, but they help us see what this UI is going to look like as a finished product. And I think that's really important. When you're putting together a menu, don't try and just put it together in Unity. Um, really create a mock-up like we've done here inside of Photoshop or Illustrator to give you a better idea of what it's going to look like in the end. All right, so we've also got some rectangles here, a little rectangle we can use to create a selection effect. So all we've got to do here is actually just export these out and you can use a really cool script called Photoshop Layers to PNG. And I will put this script in the description below. Um, so download that, install that into Photoshop and you can export your Photoshop Layers to PNG. If you're using Illustrator or GIMP, you can individually export each one um, and those will show up in Unity as well. So we'll export that and we'll create a, a folder called Layers here and just click OK. So let's start laying out the scene. Um, first thing we're gonna do is just drag our BG reference in to the scene here and make sure it's zeroed out. And so what I've done here is actually already set our camera to orthographic and 10.79 seems to be the right size of the camera. So as you can see, you can sort of scale it to fit what your size is. Um, 10.79 seems to be a good size for a 4K background image. Now we've got the background sprite here what we're not going to do is create sprites for our menu objects. Those are actually going to be UI elements. So let's go up to Game Object, UI, and create our first UI element. Click Image. Now, as you can see, it's created a UI canvas. And this, you can sort of zoom out to see this is not the camera. This is actually the UI canvas. And it will scale to the size of your camera um, at runtime in the editor and also in the actual standalone build. So let's go ahead and zero out this image. I like to zero out all of my elements um, just to get a good starting point and then I can move them around accordingly. It's good to start at a center point. So we have an image here and we can move our logo into this little image sprite component and then just click set native size. Now, what you're gonna wanna do is make sure that when you go to your game window, you have a 4K option available here. So click the plus icon if you don't have this, and most, most of the time, by default, you're not gonna have this. And you can create an, a fixed resolution of 3,840 pixels by 2,160 pixels, and click OK. And now, in all of your projects, you can have this 4K set up. Basically, what this is doing, this is previewing what it's gonna look like um, in the game window depending on your device. So as you can see, you've got 1024 by 768. Notice how it's not really working, um, and we'll fix that in a second. Um, you have 4K, which looks great, and then 1920 by 1080, which doesn't look perfect because this is actually scaled improperly, um, and all sorts of aspect ratios as well. So let's go ahead and fix that. First thing you're gonna need to do is go to your canvas scaler, and we're gonna fix the sizing issue here. Canvas Scaler by default will be slapped onto your canvas as a component. And you wanna set the Canvas Scaler to scale with the screen size. Now this is incredible. Uh, like in 2009, 2010, this option did not exist. And you actually had to code by yourself the scaling for each device. And it was a mess. My first game, Pinstripe, I had to write the whole thing from scratch um, to scale with the screen and it was a real pain, so you're really lucky to have this. So click Scale with Screen Size, and it looks terrible, right? Well, that's because the re reference resolution is incorrect. So the reference resolution, you're gonna wanna make sure in your mind 
you have a reference resolution across the board for your game. This is gonna be the sort of starting point Unity knows is the pixel size that you prefer. Um, so again, we're gonna wanna make sure that we're setting it to 4K. So let's just go ahead and change it to 4K really quick. 3840 by 2160. So as you can see, everything looks good. And when you change it to all sorts of different sizes, it looks pretty good. You can even shrink it. And notice how it's adapting to the screen size. And you can actually see it sort of delaying a little bit because it's adapting at real time. That's pretty cool. So if the user changes their screen size, like let's say they have a windowed application and they're playing it on Steam. If they're changing their screen size like this, it's actually going to update at real time. That's pretty cool. So let's move this up and then also add a flourish. So let's just copy this image here, call it flourish. And let's be sure we name this um, logo. Now this flourish, we can use the flourish left and make sure you set it to the native size and move it over here. And then you can move this one over here as well. And this will be flourish right. All right, looking good. And then finally, we're gonna add text. So just go to UI text and let's type in new game, right? New game. All right, we're gonna use a font called Barkentina. And so all I need to do, if you don't have a font you like, all you need to do is actually just drag the font into your project folder in Windows Explorer or if you're using a Mac, um, Finder. And once you open up Unity, everything will import properly. Your font size might be set to a little smaller in the inspector here. I like to set mine to a pretty big size so that it looks really clean and crisp. So I did 150. And now we can go ahead and set the font to Barkentina. Let's zero out this text. Notice how it's sort of off-centered. So I love to zero things out. It makes me feel uh, safe and clean. It's good to start out at that zero point. So as you can see, it's pretty small. So let's set the font size to like 35. And you can't actually see it, and that's because it's wrapping inside of this window here. So let's click this and just change the size here. There you go. So about that. And again, because we moved it like that, we have to zero it out again just to be safe. Hold shift and drag down, and it'll drag along the vertical axis. And let's go ahead and center vertically and horizontally here. All right, so we're gonna set our horizontal overflow to overflow, but we're gonna keep the vertical overflow to truncate so that everything stays centered and clean. So here you go, we have a nice, clean text image. And we're gonna set the text color to white for now. And I like to get, for my games, I like to have a nice space in between each letter. Unity doesn't have a tool to create letter spacing. So for now, we're just gonna do something like this, and that's gonna match our Photoshop file here create that sort of spaced out, traditional, almost vintage text. But you don't have to do that, obviously. You can do whatever you want. Doesn't matter. So there is our text. We're gonna zero it out. And we can just go ahead and create our other text as well. And you can change the name for each one. Options. And then quit. So there we have it. These are your text and your background will show up behind it when you're in the game view. So if we hit play, you'll notice that everything pretty much stays the same. So this is the general layout for your canvas. And again, if you change the sizes, everything looks good. So whether you're on mobile or Steam or Xbox or Switch, it'll all show up properly. There's really nothing else you have to do. So now what we're going to want to do is actually create animations for selecting and deselecting our text. So because I'm a smart dude, I already have everything set up. So let's click on this and turn that on. So everything is set up. I didn't want to have to create this again. I figured it would be a lot easier to show you how this looks when it's already completed. So this is our canvas. Let's delete that back up there. And you'll see that I have prefabs here. I have a prefab called menu button. So let's click this arrow here and it's gonna take us to the prefab. This is a default prefab um, and we can use this over and over. So we have a prefab called menu button now and we can use this across the game entirely. So it has a text 
field has a rectangle and it's inside of this parent called menu button. So this is actually really cool. This rectangle I can scale at any size using these handles here. And these rounded corners will never change their size. So watch what happens if I change it from sliced to simple, which simple is gonna be its default. If I scale it, look what happens. These stretch, it looks ugly. It looks like a really terrible PowerPoint presentation. My teachers used to do this all the time. They would scale rounded rectangles and it would look like this. You don't want that. So we're gonna make sure we go back to sliced. Now, in order to set up the slice, you can actually go to your sprite here, click sprite editor, and see these green lines here? I set these up before recording the video to show you that we can actually move them. And what it means is, is that this corner here, this corner here, this corner here, and this corner here will not scale. So no matter how big the image gets, those will always remain the same size. The only thing that's going to scale is this centerpiece here. So if we had like a cool texture inside, that would scale up really big, but the edges of this rectangle will not scale. So this is really cool to have. So this is really useful if you're gonna have a very detailed box. You see this in games like Breath of the Wild where the edges of a box are really ornate and delicate and there's maybe some cool designs. And Nintendo can scale up that box as big as they want to um, and it will always look pretty. So let's go ahead and hit apply and you can see now that our rectangle we can use and scale as much as we want. Now just be careful when you're scaling this. If you're going to scale it this way or that way you'll notice that it's now off-centered. So just make sure you center it back up. So it looks pretty clean there. Now what you also want to remember, and we're going to jump into this in a second, when you're animating your UI elements, you need to have rules in your mind. Okay, so there's actually two ways to scale a UI element. You can scale it with these handlebars. And watch this, the width and height here are actually changing. A good way to think about this is this is the actual maybe pixel size of your object. So you can scale it with these handlebars. You can also scale it with maybe a scale parent property and so this actually you can set to 1.2 1.2 and notice it's scaling it across the board so think about this as almost like a overarching scale and then the width and height is something beneath that so no matter how we change the width and height this multiplies and makes it bigger and you'll see why this is effective in just a second we have our menu button prefabs that i showed you and each one of these has a different text in it, and we want to scale this rectangle based on the text size. Now we could do this with code, and I've seen people do this before, but it's actually pretty challenging to get it perfect um, because every letter size is different. But we can do this manually for now. If you're going to be localizing your game, then you're gonna to wanna to write a script because every text field is gonna be a different size based on which word and which language is being used. But for now, we're just gonna, I'm gonna show you how to set the size of each one. So let's set this rectangle to this. And you can see that the continue button, it's a little smaller. And then the rectangle for quit is a little bit smaller as well. So we have that set up and let's just zero out the positions. There we go. And then finally, what you're gonna wanna do is create animations for your menu button. So because I've already sh created this prefab, I can just show you the animations that we've created. So you can see in our project hierarchy here, we have a animator controller and it's got a different icon than this one, which these are animations. And this is the controller. This is the state machine and we're gonna be able to control which animations are played based on Booleans. I know it sounds confusing, but give me just a second, I'll try and explain it. So we have this menu button and notice it's capital letters. I like to keep my controllers capitalized and I like to keep my animations lowercase so I know which one is kind of the parent and which one is the child. So let's go ahead and go to window general or window animation animator. And let's put our animator state machine right here. And you can see that we've already, I've already created here the state machine. We have a deselected animation, a pressed animation, and a selected animation. And they're sort of set up in a triangle here to help me visualize how it works. And let me show you what each animation looks like. 
So if I, if I click on any one of these menu buttons, they all have this animator component, which is referencing the controller menu button. Each one has the three inside of it. So the selected one, if we hit play here, all it is is one frame, and it's just scaled up. Now you can make this as complicated as you want. You can make it bounce a little bit, and I'll show you that in a second. But for now, all we need is one frame. We could go to press, and press is when the user actually maybe taps it on their iPad or iPhone, or when they press the A button or the Enter button. So you can see here when we press, it just flashes a little bit. Notice how it's looping. But it simply flashes white, sort of presses in a little bit so you can notice the scale. And again, this is why we are using scale. We can't actually animate the width and height. We don't want to do that because that's actually going to change the width and height of the rectangle. And we don't want to do that because that will suddenly turn those variable sizes into a constant. And all of the sizes will be the same. We don't want that because all the rectangles are different. But we can change the scale here. And that's just that multiplier. So we're going to set it to 0.9. And so when it goes, it when you press it, it actually goes small. It's almost like you're pressing in a button. It shrinks a little bit and then bounces back. And the rectangle flashes its color as well. Notice over here, it's flashing a little bit. In order to change your color and your size and all that, we can change pretty much everything that's a child of the menu button that has this animator class. We can change that by clicking record and actually adjusting things. We can make the text turn green if we wanted to. maybe red and it would flicker green and red but that looks terrible so we're not going to keep that but overall that's how you do it as long as the animator function is on the parent these can be animated as well so this animator here is going to control everything that's inside as a child so again we have all these cool animations here for each state deselected pressed and selected so as you can see very simplistic right Nothing too fancy. Now each one of these menu buttons has a different state machine. Each one is referencing a default state machine, but each one can be controlled individually. <clears throat> so as you can see, new game is selected and that's this button right here. You can see that this blue bar is indicating that it's selected. It's set to not loop. We don't want it looping. Nothing is looping. And the reason why it's playing the selected animation is because the transition here calls for the condition selected equals true. And that's being controlled by a script and we'll get into the scripts in the final segment of this tutorial. It also says if selected is set to false, it will go back to deselected. It says that if pressed equals true, it will go to the pressed animation. If pressed equals false, it will go back to the selected animation. So as you can see, it's checking for certain conditions and we set those conditions with scripts and if those conditions are met, it will jump to each animation. Now, as you can see, I've deselected has exit time for most of these animations and these transitions simply because when the user presses the input button, you want it to be immediate. You want it to be really quick. And what exit time tells Unity is that it's going to wait for the selected animation to play before the pressed animation plays. So I want the moment I press space, I want it to immediately jump to the pressed animation. I don't want it to wait. All right, so those are our transitions. Again, we're, we're setting conditions, selected equals true or selected equals false, and the arrow indicates where it's going. So the reason why we're using an animator controller as opposed to the button class, a lot of you might have used the button class before, which is an out of the box component that Unity has, is simply because with animation, we can actually make things really cool. So let me show you how we can do that. So instead of just changing the color and size when we've selected, we can actually make it bounce a little bit when you've selected it. So let's click record here. We're going to change this to 1.2. See that? And then we can sort of zoom out here and maybe right there, set it to 0.8 or 0.9. And then 1.1, 1.1, and then just lerp and just smooth to 1. So now we have a bounce effect when you select the item. Pretty cool. So now we have a really cool bounce effect. So that is why we're using animations to control how things look.
because you can really get complicated, make it look really special. We could have particle effects coming out of each button. We could have sounds and, and rotations happening. So I wanna go ahead and get into the final portion of this video, and that is the scripts. Believe it or not, the scripts are incredibly simple. The first one that I wanna talk about is the menu button controller. And this is what we're gonna slap onto the canvas here. So let's take a look at the menu button controller. All you gotta do is drag menu button controller to canvas. So as you can see here, all the menu button controller does is it tells Unity what the index is. And what I mean by index is which button is selected. So we start at zero, which is new game. Plus one takes us to continue. Plus one takes us to quit. And then if the integer is higher than our max index value, which in this case it's two because zero, one, two, it'll loop back to zero. So as you can see, we have a max index value of two, zero, one, two. We have an index value of zero, which that's the starting point here. And then it also checks to see if the key is down. All right, so let's jump into the script and I can show you how it works. So our variables are really basic here. We already talked about them, index, key down, max index, and then audio source, which is just gonna reference an audio source component. And on start, we're just going to set a variable called audio source, which we've already defined here, a public variable. And all it really is, is it's referencing the audio source component in our game object. Now on update, all we're gonna do here is check to see if the user is pressing up or down. That's all we gotta do. Regardless of what device they're using, whether it's a, a gamepad or a um, keyboard, we're gonna check and see if their vertical access for their input, meaning pressing up or down on the gamepad or the keyboard, if it does not equal zero, then it's gonna start incrementing our index variable. Really quick, let's go ahead, go back to Unity, and I wanna show you what is actually happening inside of Unity. So if you go to Edit, Project Settings, you can see we have this input field here. And what Unity has done for us is they've already created all of the various inputs that are gonna be used by most players on most devices. So vertical, all it is, is it's an axis. So it's listening for a controller input up or down or a keyboard up or down. And what it does is it increments from zero, a starting point of zero. If the user presses up, it increments to one. If the user presses down, it decreases to a negative one. So go ahead and set the gravity to a thousand. And all gravity means is how quickly it goes back to zero. So believe it or not, we can have it so that if the user presses up and goes to one, it'll slowly slide back to zero. But we want it to be really quick. We want to say if the user's pressing up, um, it's going to immediately to one. If they release the button, it goes back to zero really quickly. So all that's happening here is we're, we're increasing the index if the max index is not met. So if index is smaller than max index, we're gonna increase our index. This is just creating that loop effect. If you get to the bottom, it's gonna go back to the top. And this right here is checking simply if vertical is smaller than zero, meaning if the user pressed down. If they pressed up, which is greater than zero, it's gonna decrease the index, meaning go backwards on the list. Again, we're setting a loop here, so if it, the index is greater than zero, um, we can actually go down in our index. But if it is zero, then it's actually gonna to go to our max index, meaning take us from new game down to quit. So it's gonna create that loop effect. Now the reason why we use if key down is simply because we don't want the user to be able to just spam up and down. So I wanna explain exactly why we're using this if key down. So let's go ahead and comment it out and go back into Unity. And let me show you what happens when we remove it. What we can do now is we can actually spam the menu. See that? So if I hold down, it's just gonna go crazy. So what we wanna do is have this check. And basically what it says is if the user has pressed the key, we can fire all of this stuff but right after it's fired, right after all these checks are fired, key down is set to true, so that this condition is no longer met. So the moment they release the key though, meaning the moment the input axis for vertical is set to zero, then it's gonna be set back to false, meaning they release the key and they can press it again and again and again. So let's go to our actual menu button here. The prefab you notice has a menu button script on it. And this is really simplistic. Obviously we wanna reference the menu button controller here. We also wanna reference two animator classes that I'll get to in a second. This is just the animator itself, and then this is animator functions, which is the last script we'll talk about. And then finally, we have a, a 
integer called this index. And all that is is its label. Which index is it? So you can see here that this menu button's index is set to zero. This is one and this is two. You could also define this by which child it is, but for now we're just gonna say zero, one, and two. And so again, what's gonna happen is the menu button controller, as the index increments, these buttons are gonna listen and say, okay, what's my index value? Is it one? If my index value is one and this value is set to one, I'm going to animate. So this is how the script works here. We actually don't need anything in start. So we can just remove that. And this is happening on the update. So all we're doing is checking for a condition. If the menu button controller, which is that parent controller, if the index value is the same as this current index, the index that we've set manually for each individual button, then we're gonna fire the correct animator scripts. So we're gonna set the Boolean selected to true. And then we're gonna check and see if we're actually pressing the submit button. So Unity already has a input called submit that we can use, which is the enter button, the space button. The submit button is actually a float value. So it's again, just like the axis is, it's zero. And then if the user presses enter or space, it jumps immediately to one or back down when they release. And we say if it's set to zero, not one, meaning they release the button, it's gonna set the Boolean back to false. And then it's gonna set this interesting variable called disable once to true. And we'll get to that in just a second. And then finally we say, if it's not equal to the current index, then it's just gonna go back to selected false. So we're setting Booleans for our animator. And those are gonna tell the state machine what to play. All right, the final script. The final script is actually gonna play our sounds for us. And this is actually one of my favorite scripts to write when I'm making games. It's something called animator functions. And these are functions, all sorts of cool functions we can create um, to fire in our animations. Whenever we're playing an animation, whether it's a boss or a player or trees blowing in the wind, we can play certain animations just by clicking on the actual animation field here, clicking this new event clicking this new event button. And then you can choose all sorts of cool functions that you've created. Right now we only have play sound, but we could create a function called emit particles. We could have one called screen shake. We could have one called quick game. All sorts of cool events that will play when an animation actually plays. So right now all we have is the moment that we've actually selected our button, it will immediately fire this event here called play sound. And if you look at our script here, this function play sound actually has a parameter for an audio clip. So we can actually choose which audio clip we want to play. So in our case, we actually have this sound called click conversation progress, meaning as we go down and progress through the menu, or maybe a conversation in our game, it will actually play this sound. And then finally, for our press animation here, we have one same sort of thing, event called play sound, but in this case, it's click conversation end. So it's a selection sound. So it's really simple function here. Now again, remember we have this if disabled once, you don't actually have to have this to get it to fire. All that we're really interested in here is telling the audio source, which is on the controller, to play one shot, which is gonna play a single sound really quick, and it's gonna play which sound, which is again, this parameter here. So let's jump into the future and I wanna show you the cool things that you can create with your menu. We're in the future. So as you can see, things look a little bit different here. You'll notice that our background looks really cool. Um, you can actually create a 3D background behind um, your scene. So notice I have this really cool background here for a sort of layered look and feel. And let's go ahead and hit play and show you all the cool kinds of things that we can create. All right, so as you can see here, things can get really complicated, but as long as you have that foundation, as long as you have the simple core for your menu system, you can really get things looking amazing. But if we click start game here, we can actually fire another menu system and sort through that menu system and then go backwards or you can actually quit the game. So there's just a ton of different things you can do, transitions between each menu, transitions between each button. It can get really cool. So instead of creating static, simple 
button classes that change the color, for example, of your button, you can actually just have it fire an, a different animation and create some really cool animations for your menu. All right, guys, that's it. That's how you create a menu in Unity. If you like this video, please hit subscribe, hit the bell icon to get notified of when I live stream. I live stream game development. It's like one of my favorite things to do during the day. If you want to see me do that, hit the notification bell and you'll get notified and you'll get notified and you can join the conversation. If you want to get mentored by me, head on over to Patreon and see if that's something for you. I like to meet with people over Skype and talk about game development, help you take the next steps to becoming a successful indie game developer. Also, if you want to see your name in the credits of the next video, head on over to Patreon and support for $5 a month or more, and you can see your glorious, beautiful name in the credits of my next video. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. Bye.